Today, I'll show you how compatible all the existing NuGet packages are with .NET Standard 2.0. Hello, friends of .NET. I'm Emil Landworth, and you can find me on Twitter at TerraJobs. In this episode, I'm sharing a report with you that we created in order to assess how compatible NuGet org is with .NET Standard 2.0. So let's just jump right in. So in my previous demonstration, uh, where I talked about what's new in .NET Standard 2.0, I shared this one slide with you, which basically says that from all the existing NuGet packages that are available right now, the vast majority of them still targets .NET Framework and does not actually target .NET Standard or portable class libraries. So what we've done in .NET Standard 2.0 is we have added this thing called the Compatium, which allows you to consume an existing NuGet package as if it were targeting .NET Standard. And the question many of you had is, okay, how compatible is that in practice? How many packages can I actually consume? And you know, what happens with native dependencies and all of that? So what we have done is we have taken a look at NuGet.org, downloaded all the packages, and ran a compat analysis. So this report here is basically two parts. The first part is the managed API compatibility, and the second part is native dependencies, or also known as PInvokes. So let's take a look. So first of all, when we look at the managed API compatibility, um, as I said, we have downloaded all of NuGet.org, and by all of it, I really mean latest versions. So we haven't you know, assessed the historic versions of the packages. Um, but at the end of the day, what we have done is we've basically broken this into two categories, top 1,000 and then the long tail. Because top 1,000 is the thing that everybody's using, and it kind of changes the perspective uh, depending on how compatible the top 1,000 ends up being. And then when we look at the packages, what we've done is we've basically broken this into three broad categories. Category one is packages that already target .NET Standard and .NET, uh, or sorry, portable class libraries. So they're expected to just work. Then there's packages that don't, but only use APIs that actually exist in .NET Standard 2.0. And then the third bucket is basically all the other ones that do not work because they use APIs we don't have. And then for the ones that don't, we looked at the missing APIs, we grouped them by namespace, and then assessed how strong the dependency ends up being. Because one of the hypotheses that we had is that, you know, there are some packages out there that call this one API in WinForms, but it was really for debugging purposes, so it's like message box show, but, you know, it's not really meant to be a, a, a WinForms component. So we took a look at that as well. So let's first look at the overall breakdown. So in the top 1,000, there's 30% of packages that actually provide what we call portable assets, meaning they target .NET Standard or portable class libraries. 33% do not, but only use APIs that exist in .NET Standard. And then 37% are, are still incompatible. So that basically leaves us with about 63% in the top 1,000 that will run on .NET Core and .NET Standard 2.0 from an API standpoint. Right? So we still don't actually know when you actually run the code. Um, but we have still, um, you know, the, the hypothesis still is if you run on .NET Core on Windows, that should just work. If you run .NET Core on Linux, you know, the component may not be written with Linux in mind. But the first step is always API compatibility. If we look at the 37% that do not work still, the question is uh, what do they use? And so what we found is that about 24% of the top 1,000, so it's about you know, more than 2 thirds of the remaining uh, parts, use what we call app model specific APIs, meaning they depend on things like WinForms, WPF, Xamarin, and so on and so forth. So the statement here is those are probably packages that are not meant to run universally everywhere, but they target specific APIs because they only run in that context. The other thing that we entertained as an idea was to say, well, even if you have a package that targets .NET Standard, given how few APIs .NET Standard 1x has, if it also has a .NET Framework uh, binary in it, is it sensible to assume that the .NET Framework uh, binary is more feature complete, has more features? In other words, is the .NET Standard version the one that is dumped down? So should we, starting with 2.0, prefer the .NET Framework asset if the only other asset we find is the .NET Standard 1x asset. And so first of all, 87% of the 30% of the packages uh, that provide .NET Standard-based assets also have a .NET Framework asset, out of which 70% are compatible with .NET Core and .NET Standard. So that sounds great, but the remaining 30%, 30% is still a pretty high number. So if you would start to prefer assets that would target .NET Framework, well, they will not work, even though the, the same package would have had .NET Standard assets that are meant to work. 
So we said, no, we're not doing to do this. We we're basically still using the .NET standard in a sense. So that was one outcome. So now let's look at the missing APIs in the top 1,000. And what you can see here is basically a chart that has the namespaces on the left-hand side. And then we grouped what we call the app model-specific namespaces with parentheses, so they all show up at the bottom. And then what we have done for each package is we have basically counted the number of APIs that they call from each namespace and then color coded that. So what you see here is in this very light red is when you have uh, you know, one API call only. And then it's getting due to darker reds that the stronger the dependency ends up being. And we basically stopped at 50. So when you have more than 50 API calls in the namespace, you really heavily depend on that namespace. That's kind of the, the assumption here. So what you see here is that, um, first of all, most packages that depend on app model specific uh, APIs really depend on ASP.NET. That's the predominant app model, which is unsurprising considering that NuGet really started off uh, as an ASP.NET uh, feature more than anything. So that's kind of what you would expect to see. Secondly, uh, packages that depend on app model specific APIs, you can see this in the color coding, they're really usually you know, dark, dark red very quickly. And so that means they're really depending on uh, these app model specific APIs for good. They're not just calling one or two APIs in it for the most part. They actually heavily depend on that. So they really cannot be separated from that app model easily. <clears throat> so what we've then done is we have ex excluded what we call the lost causes. So if we exclude all the packages that, that, that depend on app model specific APIs, the question is, what does the remaining field look like? Because the assumption here is maybe there are some APIs we should add that would make more of these packages just work. And so what we have here is a much saner breakdown. Um, there's a small number of app model agnostic uh, packages here. Overall, it's only 120 if you look at the number uh, on the, on the x-axis. Um, and if you look at the remaining technologies that we see here, is most of them only use a few APIs here and there. So there is an actual uh, argument to be made for we could just fill in those things and then have more packages up and running. OK, now let's extend this analysis to all of NuGet.org. So again, we just looked at the top 1,000. So if we look at all of NuGet.org, what does that look like? And uh, you can see the, you know, the previous bar chart is at the bottom for reference. If we extend this to all of NuGet.org, it looks very similar in total numbers, as in you know, instead of 63% and 69% that are API compatible. Uh, overall, there's fewer assets that are targeting .NET Standard .NET and portable class libraries which is somewhat unsurprising because the top 1,000 had always higher demand to, to provide those assets. Um, and then again, the rest just shifts slightly. Again, the, if you look at the number of app model specific API usages, it's about the same number. It's 2 thirds of the remaining category. It's about 20% overall. And then if we look at the .NET framework uh, analysis we've done earlier, uh, when, when assets have both, uh, sorry, when packages have both assets, .NET framework and .NET standard assets, Compatibility is slightly higher, but 88%. Still not like it seems like a good idea to prefer assets that may not work um, if compatible assets exist. So that's why we decided not to do that. So if we look at incompatible API usage overall, it looks very similar. Um, app, yeah, HPNet is the dominant app model here, and uh, again, like if you depend on app model, you depend on the app model for good. If we Again, exclude the lost causes here. What we see is the breakdown is also very similar. It's, uh, um, you know, it's still a relatively small number of app model agnostic packages. It's 7,000. I mean, again, we look at all of NuGet.org, which is you know, about, I think, 70,000 packages at this point. Um, and again, like the remaining technologies, you know, there's usually few, few API calls for the most part. It's not like an overall very strong dependency. So how would we summarize this, these findings? So first of all, if you look at you know, all the packages, 69% of all available NuGet packages are API compatible with the standard. Um, we definitely should not prefer .NET framework assets when .NET standard assets exist, because worst case, they're only 70% compatible, and that number is not high enough to warrant that. Um, what we found is that our initial hypothesis was true, though, which is when both assets exist, the standard assets have substantially fewer APIs, about 10% less API service that they offer. In some cases, even up to 50%. Um, so they usually expose you know, dump down or cut down functionality. Um, about 20% of all the NuGet packages are app model specific and thus not applicable. Uh, most of them depend on ASP.NET. Um, and when they depend on the app model, they really depend on it for good, usually. 
And then we have 11% of all new game packages that, 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 that use missing APIs that we, that we, that we can't make work, um, again, excluding the lost causes. Um, and so the most heavily used component that we don't have currently is system drawing, which is why we bumped our priority to support system drawing. Um, we will probably not make system drawing cross-platform. We, we talked with the Mono guys about that, but the, the reality is that system drawing is inherently tied to GDI and GDI+. Plus. Uh, it's somewhat hard to make that cross-platform without crippling the APIs, and that kind of defeats the purpose here, which is you know, have, have it just work. So system drawing is going to be probably be a .NET Core component that will only run on Windows. Uh, we have a bunch of missing APIs in system data still, uh, which are currently worked on. And uh, I think we are uh, you know, expecting this to uh, be fixed soon, probably post.NET Standard 2.0, but probably early in, in .NET, uh, .NET Core 2.1 or whatever, maybe even 2.0 if we can pull it off. Um, the rest of the API usage that we see are distributed across a wide variety of namespaces. Um, most of the technologies that we see people use, we already have in .NET Core and .NET Standard. Um, we don't believe that there are many APIs we can easily add back, if any, because when we designed .NET Standard 2, we really tried to max out the API service we can give you without having tons of broken functionality or bad dependencies. So I think we just have to accept that about 11% of packages will probably not work. We can probably get the number down a bit, especially after system data and system drawing are, uh, uh, are done. Maybe there's even more stuff down the road. I mean, we already saw directory service and, and, uh, and, and other pieces. But I think the overall number uh, will not change drastically, because even if we address some of these technologies, the same packages that use those also use other APIs that we may not have. So I think overall, about 10%, maybe slightly less than 10%, we can probably hope for. All right, let's look at P invokes. So when we looked at P invokes, we did a very similar analysis. We looked at top 1,000 and then the rest. And then we have basically looked at P invokes in the buckets uh, that we already established for the managed API surface. So we get like a, a, an apples to apples comparison here. Um, and then again, we bucketize the P invokes you know, for what they are, op for, you know, which operating system they're targeting, and then plotted how strong the dependency is. So if we look at the top 1,000 packages, what we see here is in the 30% category um, that, that, that provide portable assets, there's 3% that use P invokes. Um, in the remaining, it's 4%. And then overall, like in the remaining pieces, it's 5%. So it's, you know, the, the less compatible things are, it turns out the, the more P invokes they're using too. So not, not entirely unsurprising. So 11% of, the, of, the, of, the, of all the packages that have compatible managed, you know, from a managed standpoint, compatible APIs use P invokes. So if we look at all the packages on NuGet.org, it's slightly, uh, slightly better, actually, um, similar to before. So we, in the 12% bucket, it's only 0.4%. Uh, and then in the 56%, uh, it's 4%. Um, and so you can see that we have um, about 6.5% of all the packages on NuGet.org have P invokes uh, in packages that are API compatible API, uh, from a managed standpoint. Um, so we now look at the API, uh, at how strong the dependency is and what kind of things we see here. So uh, we tried to plot it. Um, turns out there's some stuff that we still have, like Cred UI, I believe, and WinMMM, which uh, are actually Windows technologies. We probably should just group this under Windows. Um, but as you can see here is the overwhelming majority of P invokes are for Windows, which is unsurprising considering that .NET uh, started on Windows. Um, there's a good amount of uh, APIs that are basically wrappers for existing APIs. You know, SQLite comes to mind here, and uh, uh, IKVM as well. So they are basically distributing the package themselves and the binary themselves. Um, the problem with these kinds of cases, by the way, is even if they provide the binary, the binary may not work. Um, but we still have this problem that even if we just, you know, if you deploy the binary as is to Linux, um, you know, it's a Windows-only binary, so it only will work on Linux if the package author provides uh, a binary that is actually compatible with Linux. And uh, when I say Linux, I really mean <laughs> there's plenty of flavors of Linux. So even if the underlying technology is cross-platform, the package author has to package up essentially the correct version. So generally speaking, those packages may not work cross-platform. Some of them will. Some of them will probably not. But they probably could. So as .NET becomes more cross-platform, I would expect those packages to be more, more platform as well. Um, yeah, if we exclude the lost causes again, if you only look at um, you know, the, the packages that are meant to be cross-platform, the hope was that maybe the number of P invokes of Windows also goes down. Uh, 
I would say looking at this chart, <laughs> it's not really true. Like the number of P invokes is more or less the same, and again, like the overwhelming majority is uh, is Windows. Um, so I will summarize this. So basically, the total number of uh, packages, uh, less than 7% of the packages that are API compatible have P invokes, which is good. Uh, so it's a small number of packages that are potentially broken. Most of them depend on Win32, i.e., they will not work on Linux, most likely. Um, and then those libraries should work fine on Windows, um, because if you run .NET Core on Windows, there's not a reason why the P invokes wouldn't work, because it's still the same, uh, same environment. Um, Generally speaking, our PNBOOK analysis does not change what we said earlier. And we look at 70% of the packages are API compatible. We always made a statement about API compatibility uh, from a managed standpoint. PNBOOKs, in many cases, they're already guarded correctly when they fail. Uh, so they may actually work even if the PNBOOK can be resolved. Um, and we know from our experience talking with the Mono guys that, uh, yes, there are issues with PNBOOKs. Uh, but generally speaking, enough stuff just works that it's not you know, usually a blocking issue. Of course, there are libraries that just wrap existing native technologies, and they will not work as all, you know, at all, potentially. Uh, but given that the number is 7%, it doesn't really change the drastic picture. So worst case, we're not having 70% of packages that are API compatible. Maybe it's only 63%. But still, with our efforts that we have put in Standard 2.0, the majority of, of .NET Framework packages that exist on NuGet.org will at least resolve and bind uh, in the context of .NET Standard and .NET Core, which means you can give them a spin. You can see whether they run on cross-flat Linux. And uh, for the most part, if they don't, you can just file bugs. And uh, the package author can make incremental changes rather than having to rewrite the entire package. All right, that should be uh, today's talk. Uh, I hope you find this interesting. Uh, by the way, the report that I shared, to you, I shared with you is pretty much the exact same report we presented internally. I will also upload those slides in case you want to you know, take snippets out of it and share them at your favorite conference. All right, I say thank you very much, and then hope I see you next time. Bye.